Hey, everybody, it's Kevin and it's Donna, and welcome to another episode of The Med List. My cheeks kind of hurt a little bit, Donna, from just laughing <laughs> off, offline about all things uh, life and medicine yes. uh, with you and with our guest. She's going to be absolutely fantastic, everybody. So you guys will really enjoy this. Um, we don't have visual for it, so don't think that you uh, have something wrong with your screen. Um, she is off of a video right now, uh, but it's going to be an incredible conversation on something we don't talk about enough, Donna, and it hit a lot of headlines over the last couple of years when it comes to off-label usage, right, of medications in general. But we're going to talk about two that have been really impactful through our careers. And I know, I mean, who doesn't know friends and family that have used these medications. And so I'm excited about it. Any other intro components you want to add on there? Yeah, I think it's just this overuse um, side of things that we're always looking at too, Kevin. And then also this off-label, which might be a new thought for some folks. So I think it'll be super interesting to be talking about the drugs that we're going to be talking about today. I love it. Let's get it rocking. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll show something real quick, Donna, when we're kind of teeing things up right before we bring on our guests. But I saw something from um, NLM, so the National Institute of Health put out a study, and I was going to show that real quickly to kind of tee things up. Let's see. Turn oh. Here we go. Share. So here's something kind of cool. Um, so with this individual study, they were looking at percent of off-label prescriptions with strong versus little or no scientific evidence. And the purple is the little or no scientific evidence versus mm -hmm. the blue being strong. And so we're seeing more and more of these drugs. I mean, there's a massive list that I can pull up later looking at every specialty using off-label, you know, individual medications. And yeah. I was hoping, Donna, that we could do one thing, if you can, for me, is really describe for our audience, both clinicians and uh, patients, but what are we talking about, Donna, when we're talking about off-label medications? Yeah, of course. So off-label in itself um, is that a medication has already been FDA approved for a particular purpose. And what they find is that, oh, maybe it can be very helpful in another area. And there could be some small studies. There could even be some larger studies. Um, but it's considered off-label use because it's not FDA approved for that particular issue. So I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but aspirin, for example, 81 milligram aspirin that many millions of people take um, once a day for cardiovascular protection, um, there's nothing on that container, that box that says for cardiovascular um protective um, therapeutics. And, um, but it's, it's one of those things that they figured out like, oh, actually this can be really helpful um, in helping as an antiplatelet medication, right? So, so that's kind of, it was first used for pain and fever. And then they went, oh, wow, this is actually really good to keep blood flowing and to prevent clotting. So, um, so that's one like over the counter um, that we can all look at and go like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. But many drugs, really all of them that <laughs> if you think of, if you really look at the manufacturer information, they will have what a drug is approved for in its off-label uses. So what? it's not uncommon to see off-label uses, um, but what we're going to be talking about today is gabapentin and trazodone in their lists of off-label use and how that is probably what's being used more than for its original intended use. That's awesome. And as I bring Janet up, Jeanette up to the stage real quick, let me click on that there. Um, the one thing I want to say is I love the example, Donna, of aspirin. Uh, but what Jeanette is going to talk to us about today after you get her introduced is is really looking at aspirin did have issues. Like we ended up finding this 81 milligram dose was good for a cardioprotective, you know, factor right, to prevent particular clotting elements that are in play. And at one time it was used in combination with those antiplatelet drugs like clopidogrel. But then we found out later down the line that maybe it wasn't as good for a certain subset of the population. 
the exact same thing, but to a much greater extent, we're seeing with the gabapentin and trazodone components that we're bringing our expert in today. And I'll pass it to you. Yeah, thanks. So today we have with us Jeanette Wick, and I'm so excited to have Jeanette with us. Um, she's the Director of Pharmacy Professional Development at UConn. She is a pro prolific medical writer, and she's had um, previously 25 years experience in U.S. public health services, um, first in psychiatry and then later on in cancer. Um, and then other areas of expertise are management, education, veterinary pharmacy and geriatrics. So there's just so many things that interest, <laughs> I think that Jeanette brings forth. Um, what I've worked with Jeanette on in the past is um, she actually interviewed me years ago on outreach um, programs. And that's where I spent 11 years of my career in outreach in pharmacy outreach, especially in older adults. Um, and then I had the pleasure of interviewing Jeanette on socioeconomics in geriatrics. And I love so many examples that she gave. And we're comparing our homes in New England versus like homes in Florida and how access just to get into a home varies extensively. So, so now we get to talk about um, meds that we also um, have to learn so much about and have such variations in use and whether or not they really are appropriate. So Jeanette, I'd love for you to um, tell us a little bit more about you and how you got into this whole like gabapentin and um, trazodone and off-label use information. So it goes back to many moons ago. <laughs> I lived in Honolulu, Hawaii, yeah. and I needed to move back to what we called the mainland. That would be the continental United States. And uh, I, one of the things I was really concerned about was insurance. I had, I worked as a civilian for the department of the army and I thought about joining the army, but, uh, all the people in the army said, don't do it. Join the U S public health service, better deal, more patient friendly. So that's what I did. And they sent me to what was at that point the largest psychiatric facility in the United States in Washington, D.C. And I went kicking and screaming. I did not want to go to psychiatry. Right. Um, but I went and I found out that I really liked psychiatry. It was very challenging. But we're talking about the early 80s. And uh, one of the things when I got there, they were using all of these anticonvulsants or anti-seizure drugs to treat mood disorders. So, you know, this is 50 years ago, right? 50, 40, however many. I, I'm not very good at math, <laughs> so forgive me. But, um, and they would just tell me, well, we use it off-label. We use Depakote off-label. We use carbamazepine off-label. Um, and one of my very first really big deal publications was on off-label use of drugs in psychiatry. Um, and it really piqued my interest because before I went to psychiatry, I would occasionally see prescriptions for drugs. And for example, I got one that said Tagamat QID for a uh, rash. Tagamat, like really? Like that's dumb, right? But I think that people think about drugs and they think about what they could be used for. And then they just kind of apply it like Tagamet antihistamine. It's an H2, H1, H2, H2. H2. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Long day. I'll get numbers mixed up. You correct me when I say it. Okay. Sounds perfect. And, uh, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, that makes sense if it works. But, mm -hmm. you know, then I went to psychiatry and we used so many drugs off label. So consider propranolol. We mm -hmm. used propranolol for uh, violence and aggression. We used it for all kinds of things. And now people actually use propranolol to prevent PTSD. Like if you see something that is probably going to cause you to have PTSD, you can take propranolol. It could be rape. It could be you're in a war zone and you see something horrific. You could be in a plane crash. You could take 
propranolol and it will prevent or it might prevent PTSD. There are good studies. So I'm always looking at all these off-label things and then gabapentin and trazodone. <laughs> Little monsters. The music. Uh, dun, dun. <laughs> That's exactly what I needed. It's like for real. Like we are using trazodone and gabapentin for every darn thing. So mm -hmm. where do you want to start? You want to start on trazodone or you want to start on gabapentin? You know, if you would, Jeanette, I was really curious. I, I was reading through your slides that were just absolutely tremendous, by the way. Um, they had lots of artificial intelligence generated yeah. pictures. I, I think just pure intelligence from you. Um, but with, with <laughs> like each, each one of those steps, you point to a couple things that I think would be really helpful for both um, sets of audience members here is you put one slide in there on follow the money. And then I wanted to say somewhere we talked a little bit about a couple of the different like major driving factors, why these drugs came to prominence. You know, one yeah. was reduction of antipsychotic utilization, right, inside of nursing homes and other settings. And the other one was the opiate epidemic. Can you go back to that component and kind of give us a little bit of historical context on why did we get here? I can and I will. Amazing. Thank you. I got to think about it for a second. <laughs> so... One of the things that I teach students in pharmacy practice management is about balancing measures, all right? When you work in quality improvement, and that is really my first love, I love quality improvement, you have to think about balancing measures. If you take one action, how will it affect a different part of your healthcare system, your hospital, what people do? So, for example, I got like a brain glitch on for example. So, a balancing measure might be if you uh, cut back on antibiotics, do you see a corresponding increase in emergency admissions for pneumonia, right? If you tell people you've got a cough, you've got a cold, it's viral, we're not going to give you antibiotics, are you going to see more people being admitted for pneumonia, recalcitrant cough, whatever? So a balancing measure is really important. So what, do you, what happens if you tell your prescribers, don't use opioids, mm -hmm. right? Are you going to see an increase in drug addiction, an increase in illicit opioid use, an increase in fentanyl use, an increase in synthetic fent fentanyl use? Did we see that? Yes. Right How about if you, and if you go back 10, 15, 20 years, if you tell all of your prescribers opioids are good, people who have chronic pain should have opioids. You should medicate pain, then what is the balancing measure, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what's happened with a lot of things, and, and I want to be very clear, and this is my own personal opinion, I think a lot of times when we have patients who have issues, our first response is snow them. Mm. You know, let's just give them something that they go to sleep or they stop complaining, right? And I think that's what's happened with gabapentin and trazodone. Instead of trying to figure out what's really going on here, yeah. we give them gabapentin or, or trazodone. So let's follow the money for a minute. Gabapentin has sales of 40, $46 million in 2018, and it's up to 40 9.96, which as far as I'm concerned is $50 million in 2020, right? A lot of gabapentin going out and we're predicting $2.11 billion soon, very soon. Um, it's because some of the issues that people think is because of an increasing prevalence of neuropathic pain. It might be because of an, an, an increase in use and off-label use. It might be because there's a lot out there and people know what it is. 
you know, you go to the senior center and you say, I was having all these pains in my legs and I took this gabapentin and it made me feel better. And then the person sitting next to you goes, I have pains in my legs. I could use something that would make me feel better and goes to the doctor and goes, I want gabapentin. It's also cheap, 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 right? And there are new formulations coming. So, you know, with gabapentin, we got all these pressures, these market pressures, always follow the money. Totally critical to follow the money. Trazodone. The sales in 2017 were 22 million. And then it went up to about 24 million in 2018. And it's over 2000, uh, over 24 million in 2019. And then it went to 26 million in 2020. It's just growing, right? And its use as a hypnotic to deal with insomnia is people, so trazodone is only approved for seizures, right? right? It's probably approved for something else, but yeah. we use it more often for insomnia. Yeah, right? I have a pentance for seizures, trazodone's for depression. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I told you I was tired. That's okay. Yeah, we're good. You're right. Taking and, trazodone's. That's, that's a big positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's if you follow the money, and part of it is that people don't people, meaning prescribers. And when I say prescribers, I mean physicians, nurse assistants, um, physician's assistants. Sometimes you got nothing. You know, you have a patient comes in, they've tried a Z drug, nothing. They've tried uh, all kinds of things, nothing. And then you can give them tracidone and they sleep. The one thing I wanted to point out, Donna, is that um, Jeanette just did a wonderful job of talking about a pendulum swing, you know, in, in both of those settings. Like we've seen a massive pendulum swing from early kind of starting practice. And I feel like Jeanette can teach me a ton of things when it comes to historical context. But just for my limited historical context, it went from you do not want to use a Z drug on these patients. It's going to harm your patients. It's going to cause them, you know, increased grogginess, dependence, et cetera. And therefore, we're trying to find an alternative option. What are folks doing? They're moving toward an alternative like trazodone. We do not want to give our patients opiates. These cause tons of problems. Here's all the issues related to it. What's, you need to look at where the like genesis of pain is coming from is it somatic meaning like a muscular pain or is it neuropathic meaning it's coming from nerve pathways and here's here's what we're doing with these nerve pathway pain signals we're giving them all the gabapentin and so that pendulum was was brutal um jeanette and so thank you so much for walking us through kind of that piece where are we at today oh well where we're at today is that both of these drugs are being used fairly indiscriminately Mm -hmm. Um, I had to laugh. I was at the dermatologist and she was doing something that was terribly painful. And she said, tell me what you do for a living and what you're doing this weekend. And I said, UConn is having a big educational event on off-label use. And she said, well, what is that? And we <laughs> talked about off-label use. And uh, she <laughs> said, what are you going to speak? And I said, gabapentin and trazodone. She goes, oh, great drugs. Trazodone. I use it all the time for sleep. <laughs> and I said, what do the studies say about trazodone for sleep? And she said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, well, what I mean is, is there any evidence to indicate that trazodone would be a good deal for sleep? And she said, well, we all use it. And I said, yeah, yeah, we do. We all use it. But so when I started to put together the... um presentation for UConn on trazodone, I started pulling, I actually grabbed a bunch of students. So I want to give credit to students who are always willing to help. Um, and I told them, I need you to pull every single clinical trial you can find on trazodone. And they found probably 20. <laughs> wow. How many of them had more than 100 participants. Zippity-doo-dah. Yeah. I mean, it was like, really? We I, we might have had a couple 
of trials that had 100 patients or 100. We did not have any trials with a 1,000 or ideally 3,000. We, we just didn't. There was nothing there. Um, and it's been a problem for years with trazodone. Um, and then we started to, to look at the studies in, um, well, let's just go back to trazodone. So people are using trazodone in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? Tough. It's tough to treat with people with ADHD. Um, and what we found was that it was more often used in kids who were female who had ADHD, less often used in men. Um, and it's used fairly frequently off label in kids with ADHD because they can't, they simply can't sleep. What's the biological basis of not being able to sleep when you have ADHD? Right? We don't know. But let's snow them, they'll go to sleep. Right? Um, it kind of reminds me of my dad. I was telling my class the other day, we talked about panaceas. It was a big le lecture about panaceas and what people from different cultures believe. My dad believed if you had a cough and you were keeping him up, then you were going to have an ounce of hard liquor, an ounce of lemon juice and an ounce of honey mixed in a glass. Right. <laughs> and you drank that. You were like, <laughs> a drunk six-year-old who did not cough, right? And I'm telling you that that's kind of the thing with trazodone. If you have a kid with ADHD who's not sleeping, you want relief, right? But there are other off-label uses like Alzheimer's disease, no studies. People are using trazodone and people with dementia, no studies. Apnea, three studies with the largest one having 15 participants. Bulimia. 42 people, right? Mm -hmm. Fibromyalgia, they use it all the time, right? There are no studies. PTSD, there's a big study, 60 people. Um, substance abuse, 51 people, one study. So, I mean, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Using a drug off-label that's never really been tested in a sizable population. Right. So just to, you know, orientate people who aren't necessarily reading studies, um, these numbers are very, very, very minute. <laughs> it's, so uh, they're so would... small. It might be the first study that you might do as a, you know, just to see if the drug even works before you would then want to do a larger study right. to certain that there were results. And, and if you're looking at some of the newer meds that are out there now, I mean, cardiovascular meds and some diabetes meds, there's hundreds of thousands of people in these studies. Right. Um, so, right. so only talking about the, like uh, Jeanette has said, less than a hundred, these are just like start off studies just to see if right. there's any correlation at all before you would want to move on to larger studies. Right. They're they're like one step up above a rat or a mouse right. that has some kind of an issue. Yeah. Right. Like two study. Yeah. 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 So we're talking about small studies. If you look at what the FDA would approve right now, you would need a study, a, a phase one study would be small, 30, 60, 90. A phase two study might be 100, 200, 300. A phase three study, you've got to have some robust numbers, like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or you know, hundreds of thousands of people because you're not going to see those emergent adverse effects until such time mm -hmm. as you have a very, very large population. Oftentimes my family members, does this happen to you? Your family members call and say, oh, there's this new drug, gorillacillin, and it's going to fix what's wrong with me. And I tell them, why don't you wait a little bit till the post-marketing studies come out? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sure. It's tough. It's tough. The other thing I want to um, mention to Jeanette is when we're looking at these particular medications. So we've been talking a lot about trazodone, um, which was originally for depression. And now, like you're saying, snows people makes them fall asleep, right? And so giving giving um, it to the patients at night. 
um, thinking that, oh, if somebody is depressed and not sleeping because of, you know, depression purposes, um, then this is going to help them with sleep too, so that they can get sleep and hopefully feel better the next day and want to move and do things and maybe help them get out of their depression, if you will. But when we're looking at the meds and what's being used and the doses being used for these mm -hmm. off-label purposes, that's what really shocks me is when I see the trazodone 150 milligrams every night for sleep. And I just go, oh my, that is just incredible amounts. Yeah. So, um, so if you could, you know, maybe comment on that a little bit too, about not only the off-label use, but the overuse too. So we're not only overusing for, <laughs> because these are off-label and not really proven, but also the over large doses, if you will, of being medicated as well. So part of the problem with, let's talk about gabapentin first, because we've been yeah. showing favoritism to <laughs> I think it's a to go over to with this question, because yeah. I all the time, and I'm always saying, reduce, reduce, reduce. Right. So. so issues with uh, uh, gabapentin, the most common adverse drug reactions are uh, dose dependent CNS and respiratory depression, yes. right? Yes. Dizziness and somnolence, peripheral edemia, hypersensitivity reactions, and some newer psychiatric effects, right? Like suicidal ideation, right? And if they're used in combination with opioid agonists or benzodiazepines, you got problems because these are additive side effects. And people wake up in the morning and they're still kind of foo-foo in the head, right? Yeah. Uh, and in terms of trazodone, um, the most common adverse drug reactions are nausea and vomiting and dry mouth and dizziness and drowsiness, fatigue, headache and nervousness, and of course the blurred vision thing, right? Um, they can't be used with antiplatelets or anticoagulants, or they shouldn't be, but they are because... I don't know what percentage of Americans are on anticoagulants. Once you pass like age 65 or 70, the chances of you being on some kind of an anticoagulant are really high, right? It's yeah. tough. And so uh, we will also want to watch with trazodone QTC elongation. Um, and it, they ha it has a lot of interactions, but more important are the issues of abuse. Yes. Um, and several people, several people, not several people, several states have actually uh, made gabapentin a drug of abuse and put it into the schedule classification because people are using it. And folks, you have to give folks who have addictive issues a lot of credit. They can find things that will give them the high they need without getting a prescription. And one of them is gabapentin because everybody's got it. It's in their medicine cabinets. They're using it for all kinds of things. And um, so my favorite thing to do with any kind of drug is to go onto Reddit and say, what are people on Reddit saying about gabapentin? And so you'll find a chain called what to expect, expect for a gabapentin high, right? And uh, this one I loved. I'm, I'm about to take 1,500 milligrams and I have a Red Bull. And then we'll, I will be bulletproof. Like these people are educating other people that you can take gabapentin and get a high from it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why it's now considered a controlled substance in so many states, right? Um, trazodone, one of the, the highest ranking things on Reddit is withdrawal symptom. If I take trazodone recreational, what's going to happen? Um, and what people say is trazodone withdrawal is brutal and that trazodone should be in every psychedelic user's back packet, back pocket. We have a fellow uh, 
who does a lot of our psychedelic stuff, if you will, because we're moving into a realm where, uh, where we're understanding that some of the psychedelics are actually helpful with depression. They're helpful with uh, all kinds of issues. And he says, if you need something because your trip has gone bad, you need a benzodiazepine. Right. So Reddit gives out bad medical advice. Mm -hmm. We probably knew that, right? <laughs> yeah, I get all of my medical advice from Reddit. Right. So, we need to right. we need to really emphasize the um, resources that people use. But I, I'm <laughs> telling you, resources. <laughs> but I'm telling you, one of the things you need to do someday is sit down at a table at a senior center and watch the medical advice that gets exchanged. It's oh. pretty horrendous. You know, it's <laughs> tough. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah, I haven't seen any of those. <laughs> a couple yeah. things that could be really helpful, Donna, is um, gosh. So a couple personal stories with a few of those medications, right? Or those two medications we're talking about. Um, my first drug diversion as a hospital pharmacy director was with gabapentin, uh, and one of those medications at the time that was just gabapentin. Why in the world is someone stealing a massive amount of gabapentin? And I know you point, can understand why somebody would steal Viagra, right? But gabapentin sure. for real? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, gabapentin was cheap. Viagra was super expensive. Um, but with with that being said, we we did have that diversion, and at the time, it was being cut with opiates. You know, as one of the main reasons it was being funneled into the market, and because of those exact same problems that you're seeing. But the one thing I I did want to make sure the audience you know kind of realized is that. Off-label usage is very common. Like it's very common and can be successful, right? For us to see anecdotally and should be monitored appropriately. But it doesn't mean that your provider, anybody else is doing something illegal or unnecessary for your care. So when it comes to like um, litigation processes, off-label drug use is only really a problem when it's prescribed and is not part of common medical practice. So if you're a pioneer in doing the first off-label usage of a drug, you're you're going to have more liability related to it and i'm sure that what is common medical practice or isn't makes a lot of lawyers a lot of money but did want to point that out for the audience that just yeah, because and, of we're talking about it doesn't mean it's wrong for you and also these medications right. of gabapentin and trazodone they, they do work for some individuals and we do have to have the monitoring behind it, it comes down to three words it's not wrong mm -hmm. it's not wrong yeah well said the one thing though, and so here we are in the med list, right? And thinking about the med list. So when I see these, when I'm at the hospital reviewing patients with my students or doing med reviews or, you know, some family member, like you say, asks, hey, can you check out so-and-so's, you know, meds? And you see these drugs and you're just going, okay, why? That's really, you know, like everything that we do um, in looking at meds is the indication. And so what exactly are you using this for? And I know that we talked about some of the things that um, they, it can be used for, but here are some of the things that I would really love to highlight for folks is um, sometimes these get involved with prescribing cascades unnecessarily. So, um, so for example, you can't sleep. So now like, oh my gosh, I can't sleep. And um, somebody doesn't want to, you want a Z drug necessarily, something like Zolpidem or something like that. But instead, okay, let's do Trazodone, thinking it's milder, safer. They especially think this for older adults. When it could be a medication that someone is taking is keeping them up because they're taking it at the wrong time. So I've seen this happen with diuretics while I'm up all night going to the bathroom. Well, when do you take your diuretic? You know, just moving the time. Or maybe there's something with the SSRIs that someone is taking for depression and they're taking it at bedtime when moving it to the morning might be a more opportune time because um, SSRIs such as, you know, sertraline, for example, it has a little bit of an excitatory side to it. So that could be keeping somebody up as well. So those are some things that we might see as a prescribing cascade. So these are being used before really understanding what the underlying problem is, as was just as was stated earlier. With gabapentin, we see it a lot for um, neuropathic pain and especially for um, diabetic neuropathy. However, when people have been on um, metformin for 10, 15 years, their B12 
um, becomes deficient in their, their B12 stores have been kind of used up, if you will. So what happens is when B12 is deficient, you get a neuropathy kind of type of side effect, burning sensations in your hands and feet, for example. Um, and so instead of going right to the gabapentin going, oh yeah, it's probably that you've had diabetes for so many years, a B12 test needs to be done first before gabapentin has just started. So these are, it because you might do better with B12 than you would with gabapentin. So we really have to get into the root cause as to why. Why are you feeling the way that you're feeling? And I think that that's so important for our clinicians and patients to understand is if it's sleep, if it's pain or some of these other off-label uses, it could be other medicines you're taking. Yeah, and you know who's really good at figuring that out? Yeah. Pharmacists. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like pharmacists sometimes can just like look at it and go, yeah. when was the last B12? Yeah. You know? Uh, I do it all. Even with, with things like the frozen drugs, they cause mm -hmm. a lot of peripheral tingling, feet, hands, mm -hmm. whatever, especially at night. Yeah. Um, and it's innocuous. It's not a big deal. So let's not make a big deal of it. You know, let's not give a gab of pentin and say, this is going to take care of that peripheral tingling. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just add on that next drug. And as we know with um, kidney function too, gabapentin needs to be dosed appropriately as kidney function becomes reduced, especially in our older adults. But the edema is such a big deal when people have these oozing, swollen legs, and they're on high doses of gabapentin, I think that that is overlooked often that the gabapentin could be the cause of that edema. And I've had some pretty horrific cases at um, in practice that I've seen in regards to, oh my gosh, we got to get this person off of gabapentin, or at least, you know, really cut it down. So things to be aware of and very careful of. Yeah, with you. Oh, I, I love that. I think one thing, Jeanette, that I was hoping you could kind of once again educate us and the audience on when it comes to breaking down this research is really this. If, if you have looked through this kind of research, that means you've taken a lot of time to be able to break down all these studies, to be able to see what makes sense, what doesn't, looking at some statistical analysis that really goes beyond both some clinician and patient's um, time burden and just bandwidth, but how would you want to help both clinicians and patients to better analyze the drug regimens being prescribed to them, particular to when trazodone is a consideration or gabapentin? Oh gosh, I gotta think about that for a minute. <laughs> well, first of all, what I would encourage people to know is why? Why are you doing this? What are you trying to accomplish, right? And how are you going to measure it? That is such a huge thing. So many times prescribers pe put people on a drug and there's no follow-up, there's no measurement. I always tell students, you gotta be smart. You have to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-tagged. And frequently prescribers are not going to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, or time tag. But that's an area where a pharmacist can insert herself into the team and say, I'm going to have the patient keep a diary every day of what time they went to bed, what time they fell asleep, if they woke up at two o'clock in the morning, let's look at actual sleep structure. Like, or did they, you know, all of a sudden they couldn't sleep before. Now they're going to bed at seven and sleep until seven. Really? Is that life? 12 hours of sleep a night mm -hmm. for some mm -hmm. perhaps, but for most, not really. Um, so I always ask them to do that and ask prescribers if they're aware of the rationale for the over off-label prescribing. Um, and then consider it talking about the pros and cons of the drug. You know, it might be that the drug works. It might be that the drug is addictive. It might be that the patient sleeps well. It might be that the patient gets up at two o'clock in the morning and falls down. 
we're yeah. always going to have to think about falling, especially with our older adults. So those are the things that I talk about and try to encourage people to do. But here's an opportunity. We talk so much now about multidisciplinary care, right? Yeah. This is a place where pharmacists can step in and say, let me do the measuring. Let me check with the patient once a week and look at the patient's medication diary. Did the patient take it? What is the patient reporting in side effects? And what are the actual outcomes? Is the patient actually sleeping or, um, you know, whatever, less depressed or whatever? How can I measure it for you? Yeah, I think that's so beautifully said. I know that, Don, I'd love to get your plugins on some things there, but I love I love comparisons, right? Just in, in life in general, if you're trying to look at the two different options, having pros and cons put before you rather than here's what we're going to try first is such a reassuring aspect of knowing your care team is looking out for you and partaking what's called shared decision-making. Right, you know, really helping right. You realize, well, what are the options for me in general? And sometimes they're non-pharmacologic, right? I mean, I think that the one thing all three of us have, I'm sure, talked to lots of patients about is sleep hygiene. Sometimes the drug is one of the worst things that we can do to really analyze what is going on with an individual patient to do that tracking process. And the exact same thing when it comes to pain, you know, being able to institute some of our other colleagues that are in physical therapy, exercise, physiology, nutrition, in order to help us with some of those steps. I think in medicine, as, as Jeanette talked about really early, is the snow them kind of feature. That's not always just saying, I just want to knock this patient out and get rid of them. It's, I want to help them. Like, I want to find something that's going to work. And sometimes we do that with a baseball bat rather than trying to do it with a very streamlined stepwise process. And I think that's on both part of the clinicians and the patients to realize that taking time to find a good answer is a good thing. But Donna, I'll pass pass to you. No, and I agree. And um, it's part of what I talk about um, in MedStrong is how we're all responsible for over medication and we're all responsible for um you know what we how we find ourselves being on inappropriate and unnecessary meds because the patients they want to sleep right or (laughs) they want that pain to go away and you can't blame them for that and then the docs you know and prescribers they want to make their patients feel better um, and but we also have this whole industry, as um, Jeanette had pointed out previously, when you're saying you can't use this, so now you're using these other things. Like you're, you've got to come up with something, right? Um, and are we following up? And we're not necessarily doing that. So I think that that's an issue. And I just want to highlight one other point: is that whole monitoring, like that whole measurement and monitoring, and how important it is. And really, when you think about taking a medicine in general, say for blood pressure, you are measuring that to make certain that that works, right? So even if you're taking something that is not necessarily for blood pressure, but maybe for sleep, you should be measuring that sleep. And the same thing goes for when we reduce or stop medications through the deprescribing process, we want to make certain that we're monitoring for that. So whether we're reducing blood pressure, we want to check blood pressure. If we're reducing a sleep med, we want to re- we want to see how that's going. So we have to monitor no matter what it is that we're either adding or taking away from and in checking on those clinical outcomes. You know, what I really love are the dermatology studies that look at facial rash, like acne, rosacea, because you can take a patient and say, just use this medication on one side of your face for four weeks, Yeah. right? Like what, what would it be like if we could just use a heart medication on one side of the heart, right? Or if we could just use a kidney medication on one side of the kidney, we can't. But right. you know what? At some point you have to measure something. You have to measure something. Yeah. And if it's sleep, if it's pain, you got to measure it. And we we are so terrible at telling patients to record their own data. Those patient reported outcomes are so important. They yeah. can tell you, did I go to sleep? Do I have less pain? Did I wake up with the pain? 
um, and you, you, I, I am constantly giving people those little black and white marbled uh, notebooks that you can buy at the dollar store, which is now one dollar twenty five cents, and saying <laughs> every day write down all these important things. You know, tell me, and before you go back to the doctor, write it all down because when you get into the doctor, you forget, and you are so like blinded by the goldenness of the frames of the certificates that you don't speak up and say, I'm right. still not sleeping. This is not working or it is working except at 2 a.m. when I wake up. <laughs> so, well records, saying. we need records. We need patient reported data. Yeah, I think the uh, the one thing I'll, I'll leave my final note on is I was doing a little bit of digging on Press Ganey uh, just the other day. And for those that don't know of Press Ganey, you, usually you're looking at either a clinical setting or a clinician, particularly a doctor. And that's the organization or the body that's getting a lot of these metrics back on how satisfied are you with your hospital experience, your clinic experience, your physician. And some really interesting um, information from Dr. Eric Bricker, um, who's a health economist and an MD, was showing that most Press Ganey scores have individual patients rating their physicians out of 100, like 82 or 80 out of 100, somewhere in there. So everything was good. But all of us know that that's not always the case. And just because someone is good doesn't mean that they're doing the best things for you. And so I, I'm not saying that the physicians are not trying to do the best for you, but they can't do the best thing for you unless you do exactly what Jeanette was describing there. And documenting that information, bringing it to them, trying to get a concise plan out of it for follow-up and breakdown, uh, just just so important rather than you know, the, the element of thank goodness I finally got into the clinic. I'm just grateful for that and hopefully I can get this thing taken care of because it's been three months that I've been waiting. You know, having a, a more, I guess, broken down plan to go about it is so helpful. Donna, any, any parting words? I know we're getting close to the very end. This flew by. I knew it would. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I just want to say thank you so much to Jeanette for being with us tonight and to really just put a light on really reconsidering what we're taking medications for in general. That's what I love to talk about anyways, and making certain that we're taking only um, medications that we really need. So optimizing medications is so important, and we really have to be thinking about the why and um and what we're doing here so thank you so much jeanette i really you are so you. welcome i really had a good time it did go by really fast didn't it <laughs> yes i hope it everybody the out there time. is not having fatal eye rolls going why did they invite this woman <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say i got a lot of excitement from folks about this one so yeah. <laughs> All right. I hope I'll see you again sometime. Don't forget me. We won't. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. This was Jeanette. fantastic. I hope the audience, you guys all really enjoyed it. I know that there's so much more we can learn from Jeanette. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have her back on again sometime soon to talk about some of her other passions and loves inside uh, of the medical Veterinary world. pharmacy. Yeah. yeah. But my last tip before I click off, always <laughs> check Reddit. <laughs> the note, the note, the note, the note episode always check reddit <laughs> thank you all for joining thank you so much Jeanette, for being here with us and we will see you guys all next time if you haven't already subscribe to us on youtube spotify apple facebook and linkedin i think i try to get them all i'm, I'm trying to use mnemonics on these yeah, heading right over i'm gonna click on oh go ahead Jeanette. i'm sorry head right over i'm gonna subscribe all right Amazing. awesome and um, don't forget the MedStrong workbook is now out. So grab your MedStrong workbook, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.